join me in welcoming Alex Capri. It's a real pleasure uh, to, uh, to be able to kick this off and to start uh, discussing the topic that, that I'm going to bring out here, and that is the perfect storm. Before I get to that, um, let me tell you how and why I am where I am now. And I'm really a conflicted guy, right? When it comes to globalization, uh, when it comes to cross-border trade, I mean, that's been my bread and butter, right? That's, I, I have, um, you, know, you know, I am a child of the Pax Americana. And my dad was a career US diplomat. I grew up in nine different countries, moved every couple of years. I grew up an internationalist, right? And I grew up steeped in the the belief of, glo of you know, the, the virtues and the benefits of global trade. My grandparents on my mother's side were three generation shippers, a shipping company, and they had you know, business all over the place. So I am a believer in international trade. I'm a believer in cross-border commerce. Uh, that was what I studied in college. I started my career with the US Customs Service you know, dealing with imports and exports out of the United States, free trade agreements. I came on right around the time Steve, who you'll hear, Steve Olson, who you'll hear next, was at the U.S. Trade Rep Office, the USTR. I was at Customs, uh, you know, working on NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which um, that went a different way. Uh, we won't go there yet. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about today is really the most consequential changes that we've seen to the international system really truly since the Second World War. Okay? We are going through historic change and I don't think a lot of people have really come to fully grasp the scale of that. I don't think people in the corporate world, these are people, I should, I should add, that I spent 20 years uh, as a consultant, mostly as a partner at KPMG and PwC, and that was all out here in Asia, and I spent my career building global supply chains, mostly into China, right? Linking the world to China and Southeast Asia, but mostly to China, right? So this China-centric model of offshoring and, and not just globalization, but hyper-globalization. Um, that's been really good to a lot of people. But this is all changing now. This is fundamentally changing. So globalization as we've known it, hyper-globalization as we've known it, is over. It's finished. It's done. It's not coming back. Okay. That doesn't mean globalization has finished. It doesn't mean that there's no more globalization. What it means is that the nature of globalization has changed. And as we will uh, discuss today, it's more of a, 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 a landscape of globalization, right? A fracturing landscape, a landscape where long extended, hyper extended global value chains are balkanizing. They're fracturing, they're localizing, they're regionalizing, and frankly, um, if you factor in geopolitical risk, if you factor in carbon footprints and climate change, and if you factor in risks to single source supply chains because of a pandemic or the next pandemic, when that happens, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, it's time to restructure global value chains. And it's time to move them as local as possible. And frankly, if you can make local and buy local, then, then produce local. Do it locally. You'll save the environment and you'll, you'll gain all those other benefits as well. And you know what? I don't think that is such a bad scenario. We're still going to see an explosion of international digital trade as people try to leverage and commoditize data and services. And of course, there will be essential um, trade and goods. And I'll talk to you about the striated levels of trade that I see coming. A three, a, a split three level type of trading system with three different sort of zones or areas, right? So we'll talk about that as well. Um, 
I'm not going to get through all of this because we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to hit the high points. And I'm calling this the perfect storm because the, the, the convergence, the confluence of geopolitics, climate change, and the pandemic have produced the situation that we're in. And what it has essentially done is it has accelerated these changes that I've mentioned uh, around fragmentation in general. And that means other things change along with that as well. It means that um, we're, we're grappling right now for new rule frameworks, right? We're grappling for new standards. We're grappling for new uh, sort of harmonization, if you will, of, of application of behaviors, right? And how is that all going to shake out, right? How is that going to play out? Does that mean that certain countries will coalesce around a certain set of standards, right? Uh, and others will, you know, again, not join that group? You know, are, are, what are we seeing? The big, the big story here is, you know, everything I'm describing to you, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not a zero-sum game. So, again, think of this, you know, when I, when I talk about China and I talk about restructuring and decoupling, et cetera, think of this as a really, really complicated divorce with lots of kids, right, with tons of offspring, right? And they've been going at it for three decades, right? So there's just offspring everywhere. And some of them are favorite offspring, and some of them are less favorite. Some of them are evil children, and some of them are beloved, right? So it's hard. You know, how do you sort all that out? That's the situation right now that we have with China, okay? And I'll get back to that. Um, plenty to read about. Uh, I'm mean, very fortunate and grateful to the Heinrich Foundation. Uh, I've, I've written a lot on this topic, and the, and the foundation has published it, and that's all available to you. Um, just, this is perfect because we're, you know, in a, in a room full of media, but look at the headlines. Just take a minute to, to check out the headlines. China-free supply chains. I'm going to talk a lot about uh, semiconductors today, uh, sort of a, you know, case in point, uh, because uh, semiconductors are really essentially a public good, right? You have energy, you have food, and now you have semiconductors, right? You simply can't live without any of those. In a, modern, in a modern world. Um, so we'll talk about that. But this is affecting um, a lot of things, which, which we'll get into. And some of you may even have contributed to these headlines, right? Some of you may even have uh, maybe written these, some of these headlines. I don't know. OK? Um, but it's affecting people. It's affecting physical supply chains. It's affecting data. It's affecting the platform economy. Um, it's affecting, and this is what we haven't heard a lot about, and this is an area that I think is really, really ripe for upheaval, and that's global financial markets. Global financial markets in an era of sanctions, global financial markets in an era of the weaponization of currencies, such as the US dollar. Um, I mean, if you were China, wouldn't you want to develop your own currency so that every time the Americans get mad at you, they can't weaponize the US dollar? Well, that's exactly what they're doing, right? They're looking to, they're speeding ahead and they're looking to roll out the central bank backed digital rem and B. Now that opens up another can of worms around, you know, data and data privacy. And again, balkanization around standards when it comes to data and money. So I think the financial sector is really the next sector to be shaken up. And I think Wall Street's about ready to have a big branch drop on top of them as well. Seriously. Uh, and, and I'll talk about the paradoxes, OK? In fact, I think I, OK, that's the perfect storm. OK, I even changed the title of this slide. It used to just call it the paradigm shift and talk about the paradigm shift. Now I'm calling it the paradigm shift and the paradox, because the paradigm shift is producing paradoxes everywhere, right? That's that 30-year marriage, that messy, you know, fruitful, productive marriage. It's full of paradoxes now, all right? Economically, and I'm starting to really feast off of this. I'm really starting to enjoy this, uh, especially with a lot of my old academic colleagues, and that is there is a debate. There's a raging debate right now 
between the liberal classical economists, right? And the dogma is no government involvement, let the markets rule, Mo you know, capital is most efficient when markets push it and allocate it into its most efficient, productive state. We've seen 30 years of that. You look at su uh, supply chains in automotive, in pharmaceutical, in even agriculture, right? We've got massive industrialized agriculture with agritech, right, and agrochemical companies and monocrops. And you know what? It evolved that way because it's the most transactionally efficient. Transactional costs are low when economies of scale are big, right? And as we go through this so-called third unbundling that Richard Baldwin talks about, where the cost of communication drops, the cost of logistics drops, uh, AI is more powerful, connectivity is more powerful. It makes total sense to have these massive supply chains. And the name of the game is offshoring. Offshore, offshore, offshore. I can remember 15 years ago, 10 years ago, sitting in uh, corporate boardrooms and the topic of, okay, what's our growth strategy for next year? What's our growth strategy? I kid you not. One word. Anybody? One word. Offshore. Huh? Offshore, that's good. China. Seriously, what's our growth strategy for next year? China. <coughs> Done. Seriously. How do you go, how do you change that culture? We've had 30 years of this. We've had 30 years of economies of scale, right? Manufacturing base, okay, we moved up the value chain and now we've moved from cheap you know, stuff to really sophisticated stuff that's getting made in China because, because basically multinationals have made it so, right? They've shifted everything there and it's taken 30 years and we've seen the largest, swiftest transfer of wealth in human history and that's technology, right? Technology enabled that. Technology lowered barriers it was very inexpensive. You could do all that stuff at scale. And of course, AI and connectivity. Computer power, connectivity. Computer power, connectivity, connectivity, and so on and so forth. So laissez-faire, laissez-faire saw the rise of a new superpower. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't adhering to the same rules and the same standards. It was a state-centric um, mercantilist country. And it essentially has upended the international system. And of course, with the, geopo with the geopolitics involved, we're now witnessing this whole scenario of backlash and restructuring and so forth. So the laissez-faire camp is now confronted with a very pervasive managed trade mindset, meaning that governments intervene in, in markets, Governments choose favorites, they choose national champions. Governments protect favorite companies. Governments promote national mercantilist policies, uh, which we'll talk about. Um, governments protect markets, they close off markets. They do all of this and a focus has been on technology. Hence the term that I've been using a lot and that's techno-nationalism. So laissez-faire has moved to a new kind of nationalism. Um, and of course, you've been hearing a lot with the Ukraine uh, war about food security and about energy security. And that was the, actually the t uh, title of my last paper here was about food security. Um, the other thing that's changed in this paradigm, in this paradigm shift, and again, this is, I would argue, and I don't know, if, I don't know how Steve feels about this, but I, uh, uh, Steve's got wonderful, wonderful insights, and I'm sure you've been reading his stuff. But I would argue the last 70 years of the international system have been a historic anomaly. I think if you go back, let's go all the way back to the Dutch East Indies Company. Let's go back, what is it, three, four, five hundred years, whatever. My dates are not good. Um, it's been a long time. How many years has it been? How many decades has it been? Uh, centuries, rather. Um, there's been a feedback loop, right? There has been 
a constant feedback loop that involves um, economic, economic power, right? economic wealth, linked to national security or military prowess, which is, of course, linked to technology, which then forms this ever-evolving, ever-present feedback loop. It just goes round and round, okay? Now, if we go back to the Second World War and the Bretton Woods system and the, the post-World War II era, you had a unique situation where the United States essentially emerged as the chief architect, you know, the United States along with its allies, the, the UK and, and many of the countries that, that are the G7 today, eventually the G7. Um, they essentially built a system where, interestingly, security institutions were, were separate from economic institutions. We had the World Bank, right? We had the International Monetary Fund. We had these multilateral development banks. And then when it came to security, we had completely separate institutions like NATO, right? You didn't see them intertwining. But now, if you read NATO's mission statement, what, is, what are they doing? You have a security organization that is completely rewriting what it's doing. It's getting into the business of AI. It's getting into the business of cybersecurity. It's getting into the business of linking, you know, it's getting into the business of R&D and linking developments of new technologies um, to security. So that, that bifurcation that we used to see is no longer happening. Now that is more of a, a mercantilist. You know, if you then factor in all of the <coughs> If you factor in all of the other economic activity uh, that is emerging, which I'll get into shortly, that is a paradigm shift. That's a major paradigm shift. Okay. Um, I think the other the other thing to to uh, to take away from this is in a laissez-faire system, large multinationals pretty much had the run of things. They could pretty much do stuff relatively uninterrupted. Uh, okay, they would, you know, they'd get shaken down in sort of antitrust uh, uh, measures occasionally. Um, but, you know, nobody's really going to tell Coca-Cola how to run their business around the world. And nobody's going to tell, nobody's really told Intel um, or Qualcomm until recently where they can move their business and who they can sell their stuff to. Uh, but that's all changed now. So what we see in terms of this paradox is there is a new tension that has emerged between state and non-state actors that is going to play out. And that's something that you should be covering and paying very close attention to going forward because now we have a situation where state actors are between a rock and a hard place, right? Take HSBC Bank in Hong Kong, right? They cooperated with the U.S. investigation against Huawei, which sent their, uh, their, C I think it was their CFO basically under house arrest in Canada for a couple of years because Huawei was selling sanctioned technology to North Korea and Iran. Um, and HSBC cooperated with that investigation and so the Chinese government came down really, really hard on HSBC, right? Well, we won't let you do this in our market. We won't let you do that. We won't let you do this. Look at, look at um, my favorite airline, Cathay Pacific. <laughs> you know, seriously. They're getting hammered. I don't know if Cathay Pacific is going to survive because their, their CEO came out and made some statements about the national security law. Uh, you know, in, in Hong Kong and so on and so forth. But go beyond that. Um, when does a government look at a multinational as a strategic asset and say, you got to come work for us. We're co-opting you. You're building our cloud, right? You're building our rockets, SpaceX, Amazon, right? Whatever, you know, whatever. Or if you're a Chinese company, um, you know, the, the Communist Party has said, well, you, you know, you can't do any of this stuff and we're going to keep you on a really short leash, but you're building our blockchain, 
you're going to build our blockchain for our, 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 our currency, our digital currency. You're going to build our surveillance systems for us. Um, you're going to, um, you know, you're going to help us double down on our dual, uh, you know, our dual circulation uh, policy as we look to, you know, manufacture everything at home, uh, and so on and so forth. So how do you maneuver in a world like this, uh, right? If you're a multinational company, and that's pretty complicated. In some cases, you decouple. In other cases, you say. Um, okay, I'm just going to ring fence. I'm going to ring fence my entire China operations. I will source all my supplies. All my suppliers will be locally based, and I'll just produce for the Chinese market. And I'll have to do the same thing in India, and maybe I'll have to do the same thing somewhere else. Not very efficient, right? No economies of scale there. Um, so here's a paradox. Here's, here's one that you guys should be covering as well. I'd love to be reading more, and I know you guys do some really good work. Um, and that is, um, you've been hearing and covering and writing a lot about decoupling, right? Strategic decoupling. Well, what is, what, what is strategic decoupling? What does it mean? What exactly does strategic decoupling mean? It means that the word strategic is very important, right? It means that there's some kind of a critical asset, some kind of a critical commodity, such as rare earths, right? Critical minerals pharmaceuticals, now we're talking lithium batteries, of, of course semiconductors, right? Um, anything else? What else? Food, of course, and of course energy, right? Food and energy are two very, very critical supply chains that, that, that require strategic attention and strategic care. Okay, so it, it makes sense that if you're single sourcing or if you are overly reliant on any one single source, whether it's a so-called friendly country or even uh, a rival, um, that you have to change that situation. At the very least, you have to diversify and you have to have redundancies, or you simply remove capabilities and you take it you, uh, right out of the hands of your adversary. So we're seeing that happening now in rare earths. As the Aussies, the Americans, the Canadians, the Japanese, team up, the Europeans team up, and we're seeing rapid, rapid development, I should say redevelopment of old rare earth mines that had closed and now are reopening and, and so on. We're seeing that. We're seeing that in the automotive sector where supply chains become uh, strategic and critical for any of those, those materials that go into batteries. Uh, we're seeing that restructuring. So the whole EV sector is balkanizing and fragmenting. And that's actually spilling over into clean tech as well. Because a lot of the core technologies are dual use technologies, meaning that they are technologies that could become strategic at any day and they could be used for, for military purposes. Um, okay, so that decoupling is happening strategically. So that's the first level, all right? I, meant, I mentioned earlier that there were three, oh my gosh, we're moving quickly. There were three levels of supply chain that were that were um, that were basically striating, right? The first is that strategic level of all those commodities that I mentioned. If it's strategic, then we see, and you're, and we're going to continue to see, and forget about whether it's economically efficient or not. I was on a a, a panel earlier this week with some economists, and I, one of these economists kept saying, "Oh, it's never going to happen because it's not it's not economically efficient." And that is a perfect example of trying to shove a square peg in a round hole by continually trying to apply this classic liberal economic argument to supply chains. The primacy of geopolitics dictates that strategic, strategic areas must decouple and will decouple, or at the very least diversify and ring fence. And guess what? Prices are going to be higher efficiencies are going to be lower, there's going to be labor challenges, all of that stuff. But guess what? Uh, you know, imagine if Taiwan had said that when they decided as an agrarian economy to transition to become what is now the hotbed of semiconductor manufacturing in the world. Seriously, Taiwan's economy in the 1970s was agriculturally based. 
oh, you, you can't do that. Well, yes, you can, because there was a geopolitical imperative. Uh, by the way, being the old guy that I am, uh, I was in Taiwan in 1979. My father was stationed at the embassy there when the United States normalized relations with the People's Republic of China, and they closed the embassy, and they kicked everybody out. They kicked out all the U.S. diplomats because, right? And from that point onward, the people in Taiwan and policymakers in the United States said, okay, how do, we, how do we secure Taiwan? How do we prevent Taiwan from being taken over forcibly? We industrialize it. We, we invest in it. We, and, and that's what we saw. We, and so the security and the geopolitical imperative led to a massive transformation of Taiwan's economy. And if you had said, oh, well, you know, it's not economically efficient. Of course it isn't. But there's a higher imperative here. Okay? So that's what we're going to see in that first band, in that first level, if you will, of, uh, of the global supply chain. The next level is actually a much, much wider level, okay? And it's a gray zone. And in that gray zone, we have a lot of what I would call dual use technologies, right? Which is pretty much any kind of technology today uh, that could potentially become subject to sanctions and export controls depending on what happens in the world geopolitically. So you can have day-to-day -day trading, you can have large volumes of, of commerce and, and cross-border exchange happening um, and it's fairly innocuous. Nobody really cares, right? It's, everything's good? Okay, I gotta move on. Okay. All right, I think we'll, I'll stop at slide 10. Um, uh, okay, um, yeah, so, so that's pretty much, that, that's kind of a very, very, very high overview. Um, let me just spend two minutes flying through the rest of this, see if I wanna stop on anything. So t I think I've kind of defined techno-nationalism, and that is essentially where uh, um, you know, governments look at their, the, the prowess, their capabilities from a, a technological level, their innovation level, uh, and they link that, uh, you know, their own homegrown companies, they link that to national security and economic security, and increasingly to social stability when we look at things like social media and e-commerce and social commerce and that type of thing. And this sort of hybrid warfare climate that we're in Around, um, around that. So I, I think this is perfect. We'll just say, you know, we'll stop it here um, and we'll do data and other stuff another time. Um, the, um, there really are, I, I see sort of a, a phased approach to techno-nationalism. The first is the weaponization of supply chains, which we've seen, right? You cut off the supply of a critical, vital technology or component by imposing sanctions. The next thing you do is you, you reshore, you ring fence, and you, re and, and, and you reshuffle, and you friend shore. Uh, you know, you look for friendly confines. Uh, and there's some very interesting sort of divisions taking place in the G20 countries right now with the BRICS, you know, involving the BRICS and the G7 countries and so forth. And there's a lot of sort of dynamics at play there. Um, th then there's the, then the, the, the innovation race. It's... I want to make my horse run faster than yours. Uh, and I, you know, I've already taken care of making your horse run more slowly, right, in the first, in the first instance, but now I want to make my horse run faster. And I think, I think that really is a very, very important emphasis. We're going to see more and more emphasis on that uh, as, as time goes on. And then there's the techno-diplomacy aspect of it. That's where you're looking for new friends, you're looking for new partners, you're looking for new places, to really get a, 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 a jump start, right? To really jump start your innovation mercantilism and to really sort of secure your, your supply chain. So you're looking for, for new friends. So this sort of, these are all major areas that you guys should be covering, right? You should be looking at the world in this context, in my opinion. Right? Okay. Okay, that's it. I'll stop there. Sorry, I had 60 slides. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, okay. whole phase of, you know, being local, make local, how long is this going to last? Well, it's not a phase. It's not a phase. It's not, we're not going back. 
We're not going back. And the reason we're not going to go back is because it's going to be so much more efficient. It's going to be, you know, the transactional costs are going to be so much lower when you can produce stuff locally, when you have the right kind of robotics, when you have the right kind of AI, when you have uh, localized supply chains that, by the way, localized because carbon taxes are coming, right? So there's gonna, it's going to be more and more expensive to ship something across a border, especially if you're buying it from India, for example, right? If you're buying it from somewhere else, there will be other hindrances, there will be other obstacles to, to make it more expensive uh, to ship all the way around the world. So carbon footprints will be another, uh, another instance. So what the world is, uh, the, we're really grappling right now with coming up with new institutions and new frameworks around digital trade, right? Digital trade, you know, and we saw the explosion of it uh, because of the pandemic. Um, digital trade is going to produce more and more wealth. But the paradox is that as digital trade is exploding, so are localization rules, data localization, right? Data security, data transfer rules, they're on the rise. So, so that's becoming more, it's making it more and more difficult. So that's the paradox. So when is this localization thing gonna, gonna end? It isn't gonna end because um, it's, you know, as, the, as the climate gets more harsh, as we see more uh, really harsh weather, um, we see what's happening with food security now with droughts all over the world. I mean, a place like Singapore, they are, they are going to produce 30% of their food needs in vertical agriculture and hydroponics you know, within the next 10 years. So circular economies, all of that sort of thing, it's just gonna, it's just gonna be more effective, more efficient, more profitable. It's gonna drive a whole new ecosystem of tech startups and everything. Localization is great, it's great. It's going to produce a lot of wealth. Just one more question as a follow up to this. Uh, so where does the whole narrative of India being a protection, protectionist economy fit in this narrative? Uh, India is in a prime position right now geopolitically as a member of the Quad, right? It's, le it's, it's lobbying hard to get uh, semiconductor manufacturing done in India. It's decoupling actively from China. It's looking to localize particularly around the telecommunications sector and handphones, it's doing all of that. And India is a real paradox because there are these nodes of very productive centers in India. But, you know, as my good, one of my good Indian friends tells me, you know, India never misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> because of its extensive red tape and bureaucracy and corruption, and it's got serious environmental problems, and yet, you have uh, Taiwanese companies, Apple, uh, Korean companies moving big, big operations out there to hedge against China coupling. It's happening. But India is an underachiever, and it's going to continue to be an underachiever. <laughs> I will never get my hopes up about India. I mean, I, I'm, I, I say that you know, in, a, in a purely economic and geopolitical sense. Uh, China is just so much more efficient and effective than India. And it's a real shame that we're having to go through this whole thing with China right now, that we're on this trajectory. Um, thanks for chatting to us. We really appreciate it. So um, I, something that's been a real trend in uh, Western elections in recent years has been we'll build things back home, we'll move things back home to be built, things like that. But while a country like China can obviously do that because it has a you know, state-directed economy and it has enormous resources, it's a much harder thing for smaller Western countries, like it was a major part of the recent Australian election, we will build lithium batteries back in Australia. I mean, how, how realistic is this narrative that these sort of these high-tech manufacturing industries can just be sprung up in the next few years when they're facing competition from other probably still far more efficient competitors around the world. Yeah. Well, again, it depends on what level of the, of the supply chain we're talking about. If it's super, super highly strategic stuff, then I think, uh, actually, it's funny, I just, I'm just completing a, a work on this right now. Uh, 
And I think Australia is very uniquely positioned to go through a very, very unique moonshot. Uh, and I'll tell you why. One, I mean, okay, it's a small economy, it's far removed, all that kind of stuff. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, Australia is, um, is part of uh, some vital security networks with the United States. It's part of the, it's AUKUS, the Five Eyes, right? Um, if you look at some of the um, university alliances that, that are emerging between Australian universities and American universities and so forth, um, through public-private partnerships, and I didn't get a chance to talk to you guys at all about that today, but I think the way of the future is public-private partnerships, okay? Uh, and that's how these less efficient, less market-driven, but geopolitically driven um, supply chains and ecosystems are going to get built through public-private partnerships. And Australia is uniquely positioned, right? Australia's got absolutely fantastic universities, got very, very capable government, it's got a great financial system. It's linked into a very important security network. It's got a very strong alliance with the United States. So I think Australia, we're going to see some very interesting things happening in Australia. Um, you know, a country that everybody says, oh, they just do mining. Oh, they just do, you know, they do agriculture. We're going to see some very interesting things. And stay tuned because I'll be presenting on that subject very soon. Okay? Yes. Um, I'm from Seoul, South Korea. I, I, yeah, I cover EV battery makers in South Korea. You know, they are they are doing localization. You know, they are building EV batteries next to the, like a, for example, like LG is building battery plants in the U.S. next to the GM's plant. Mm -hmm. But the problem is all of the raw materials are coming from China, because China is occupying a lot of mines around the world. So, what do you, to do. It's changing. Yeah, but yeah, I, I talked to a treasure, you know, trade ministry official recently, and then also talked to Samsung, and they say they're not prepared for anything if there's a war <laughs> breaking in, you know, Taiwan, you know. So, uh, so, uh, so, um, there's a consortium of Australian and American companies together with the Defense Department that are reopening. Uh, the Mountain, the Mountain View mine in California, which is right on the the border with Nevada, which was which used to be the world's largest uh, uh, rare earths operations, and it was shut down and offshored to China, right? Uh, so they're reopening that. Um, they're doing stuff in Texas. They're doing uh, in Australia. They're they're stepping up. Canada is doing stuff. So. It's, you know, you're looking at, uh, I mean, to get a rare earth materials mine and processing operation going is a, is a 10 year process, right? It's a 10 year process, but it's happening. The Japanese are um, sitting on top of perhaps one of the, the largest rare earth uh, deposits in the Isa, Isagawara Islands or what is it, right? Did I say that correctly? Nobody's heard of it. Uh, it's a thousand kilometers. It's actually part of uh, Tokyo. It's part of the Tokyo municipality. It's these islands out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> Anyways, been wanting to go there for years. <laughs> Better get there before they start mining, right, Steve? <laughs> anyway, all right. So, so yeah. So I mean, all this stuff is happening, right? So it, it's going on. Um, it's just it, it, it's a process. Remember, remember, most of us come from a culture. I come from a culture where. You can't see beyond the next quarterly statement, right? I mean, that's that's you know, Western globalization is like, what's our next quarter? Growth at any cost. Growth at any cost, right? So of course, it, whereas I mean, with, with companies like Samsung and and you know the Korean uh, sort of the Korean system, I would think that they'd be looking a little further ahead. And of course, Korea uh, has announced. Massive, massive infusions of, of money and capital to turn uh, South Korea into a major, major technology hotbed, particularly with semiconductors. So that's all happening, right? Hi. Um, are you calling for the demise of globalization? Is that no. what you're doing? <laughs> no. No. <Question. laughs> Economies of scale dictate that, obviously, you know, as you said, these mines don't appear overnight, and certain places will never be able to produce these mines or these raw materials, yeah. etc. How on earth are they going to be able to 
withdrawal from the globalization. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that in a strategic, in a geopolitical strategic scenario, then you do have to, you have to become self-reliant, right? China's entire uh, policy on dual circulation is because they are so hopelessly reliant on foreign technology, particularly when it comes to semiconductors. They couldn't run their economy for a day if the U.S. and its allies decided that they were going to just shut off the spigot, right? So they don't have a choice. Now, while they're still able to import and still benefit from globalization, of course, they're going to continue to do that, right? And even in a world where, is, you know, if you're, if you're selling and buying from your rival, which is, you know, you see that in energy, right? The United States uh, natural gas industry has signed billions of dollars of agreements with Chinese state-owned companies, right? And you cannot do those well, the, the point is, the, the idea is if you can make money, make money, but you can't do that if that is your single source of materials. Because the, the minute there's a conflict, you're going to lose that source of materials. The minute there's a pandemic, you're going to lose that source, right? So becoming self-sufficient uh, is not necessarily synonymous with becoming totally decoupled, right? Does that make sense? I'll trade with Ben. I may have certain objections and, you know, you and I may be, you know, we may have certain geopolitical differences. But, you know, as long as, as long as you don't have the ability to just completely shut down my economy, right, we can still do business. And, and actually, we didn't have time to get into this today, but the whole game of in China for China, right, with you continue to do business with China as an American company, or Qualcomm, let's say we're Intel, right? Here's a great example. Here are two semiconductor companies that, NVIDIA and Intel, that make billions of dollars selling microchips to Chinese companies. Hike Vision happens to be the world's largest maker of facial recognition cameras. SenseTime happens to make the AI for facial recognition. Those cameras are used by the Chinese government uh, in Xinjiang province, for example, in Hong Kong, right? So what happened was, um, sanctions were imposed, U.S. sanctions were imposed, and those companies were no longer able to sell certain technology. Certain technology. There's another example here. Applied Materials and LAM Research, they make highly specialized manufacturing equipment for the semiconductor sector. When Huawei was placed on sanctions, right, the United States completely re re rewrote the export code in order to prevent TSMC from selling uh, microchips to High Silicon, which is a Huawei company, and that they therefore blocked not all technology, and this is the, this is the key, not all technology, but technology required for leading edge, leading edge microchips, to make leading edge microchips. So here's how I would answer your question, Suling. Globalization is not over. Qualcomm and many other American companies are making billions of dollars, including applied materials and LAM research. They are still selling technology to China. But in this case, it's for making uh, semiconductors 10 nanometers and larger. That's three and four generation old technology. But China can't even do that without foreign technology but where they've been totally explicitly barred from doing it is anything smaller than 10 nanometers, you need, an, you, know, you need a license and we're gonna deny that license. So globalization is not over. Globalization is striated and it is fragmented. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, now, here's a story you should be watching, ladies and gentlemen, because there is now discussion going on in the United States to actually bar old technology to companies like SMIC, SMIC, and others, right? In other words, you know, this is one of the paradoxes. If you, if, you, if you look, SMIC has had their most profitable year ever, right? If you look at the numbers, investment is surging. Money is pouring into China. 
Well, then how can there be a decoupling? Is that a myth? Why is this happening? Well, there's a paradox. People are insulating themselves and they're getting ready to, they're, they're, they're girding themselves for an in China, for China market, right? Meaning that those trade supply lines are, are fragmenting and they're cutting, okay? So they're setting up, they're investing in new partnerships so that they have an insulated in China, for China thing. The other is there's a lot of people freaking out thinking that even this older technology is going to be blocked. It's going to be barred. It's kind of like what Huawei did when they stockpiled semiconductors because they knew that they were going to be put on a, a sanctions list. So, and then, you know, when they, when they burned through that pile of semiconductors, guess what? Now they can't even uh, produce a, a phone that, that has 5G in it because they don't have access to the technology. So Huawei can't even service their old business model. They can't service their old 5G contracts all over the world. They can't get new ones, and they can't even service the old ones. But they're not out of business. They're migrating into, into, into niches. They're migrating into the automotive sector. They're partnering with EV companies. They're doing all that sort of thing. Um, so globalization has been... Uh, greatly disrupted, but globalization is not as a whole finished. And, it, you know, there's a lot of stuff that will continue to be exported uh, unimpeded. Well, it has to be because of the economies of scale across the world. Exactly. Exactly. Otherwise you have riots because prices will be way too high, which is what we're Right. Moment. Right. And unless governments can step in and alleviate those inefficiencies through subsidies, that's the only way that's going to happen. And that is exactly what's happening uh, in uh, the strategic sectors. Um, I'm curious, how would you assess uh, you know, China's response to this depopulating trend? Has the government taken any measures to kind of slow down this process? Because uh, it sounds like, you know, if, if depopulating, whether on a strategic level or not, can be quite detrimental to the Chinese economy in the long run. Um, has the government you know, what can China do? To Who started this whole decoupling thing in the, in, the, in the first place? It was Chinese, it was the Chinese government. China has been actively decoupling from the day they opened their borders, right? They decoupled actively by saying, okay, no internet companies, no foreign internet companies, no foreign telecommunication companies, right? No, um, for the most part, no entertainment companies, right? They, they've had parts of their economy closed off, sealed off. That, that's, been, that's been an active part of their policy. So I think what's surprising to me is that, um, that this model, this, this offshoring model lasted as long as it did before we started seeing these things happening. So, um, I mean, what can China do? I mean, zero COVID? Not the most intelligent, you know, okay. I don't think zero COVID is doing much good to the Chinese economy, number one. It's not doing uh, much good for investor confidence. Um, the other thing is uh, the crackdown on the tech sector in China has been merciless. And, um, you know, so they, they just concluded the investigation on Didi, the ride sharing app. They ended up paying a billion dollar plus uh, fine for endangering national security with the data of customers, Chinese customers. We didn't have a chance to talk about that. That's a big deal, right? Data wars, data geo ge geopolitics. Um, I think China will continue to, um, China's domestic economy will continue to be a very strong magnet for foreign companies. Um, but it's going to be increasingly difficult and they're going to have to operate in an increasingly insulated environment, an in-China, for-China environment, uh, which means that they're going to have to uh, compartmentalize their, their operations. Um, but here's the thing. If China 
you know, if we wake up tomorrow and a naval vessel has rammed an American ship in the South China Sea or vice versa, right? Um, all of, these, all of this investment and activity in China could go up in smoke for a lot of companies, right? And, and a lot of that, especially Wall Street. Um, but, you know, I, I, think, I, I think, you know, the, world is, the world's going through a fundamental shift. And there is, a, there is a, you know, even though China will remain uh, very attractive for a lot of companies, um, the, the way the game is played is now going to be fundamentally different than it was even five years ago. I have a question on supply chain issues. Do you think uh, the global forum like WTO uh, can play a significant role on ensuring supply chain? Recently, uh, an NC12 uh, uh, issue on ensuring food security and pandemic support came in the WTO agenda. So do you think uh, the WTO Forum of 164 members that can play a role on ensuring supply chain uh, or food chain? Food chain? I think I'll let Steve answer that one to, uh, since we're almost coming up on the hour. The short answer is no. Um, multilateralism, um, I am a believer in multilateralism. Getting 164 countries to agree on anything is pretty difficult, especially when you have to deal with a north-south divide, whether it's on climate change or anything else. Um, so um, I think the WTO um, obviously still has its, has its place, but if, if countries want to get something done quickly and efficiently, um, they're probably going to seek bilaterals or minilaterals, right? And we're seeing that happen with, with Singapore, uh, Singapore wants to remain a vibrant uh, logistics and commercial and financial and innovation hub, and it's not waiting around. It's signing digital economy agreements with the UK, DEPA, right? It's, it's pairing up and it's going out of its way to say, we are not gonna impose data localization requirements. We're not gonna ask you for a code. We're not gonna ask you for decryption keys, basically. Uh, we're not going to do a lot of these things because we're absolutely going to stay transparent and open and getting 164 countries to deal with that? No way. Forget it. Thank you. And I mean, I'll just say, you know, I'm a great believer in free trade agreements, but you've got, you know, RCEP and uh, you've got uh, CPTPP. Um, I struggle with the idea of actually enforcing the rules of origin in any of these agreements. They have got the most lovely language and they've got the most lovely ideals, especially the, you know, the, the gold standard, right? The deep CPTPP with standards around gender, standards around uh, you know, environmental qualities, carbon footprints, all these other things. Wonderful, that's just great. Good luck trying to validate that. Good luck. Now, if, if countries actually would, were to start enforcing that sort of thing, then we didn't get a chance to talk about this either today. But I, you know, I think the transparency industry is a massive industry on the up, right? Anything that confers supply chain transparency, right, is going to be critically important because you've got carbon issues, you've got labor issues, now you've got sanctions and end user and end use issues, all of those things, I promise you the world's best run companies have limited visibility in their supply chains. They really truly do because it's hard to do and because it's complex and you don't know who your supplier supplier is and your supplier supplier supplier. Uh, and um, so that's another reason why some companies will just say, forget it, I'm localizing. I'm moving my, you know, forget it. I'm not running my supply chain through Pakistan anymore. I've got robots and automation that can do all that stuff. I don't need 50 people in Vietnam putting together a running shoe for me. Has anybody been to a, a, a shoe factory in Vietnam lately? I mean, like in the last year or two? I mean, so, oh, okay, yeah, that's true. All right, so in the last five years, right? I mean, Go to a, a shoe, go to a Nike shoe factory or an Adidas shoe factory. What? 
Are you kidding me? There's like, somebody's gluing something on the shoe by hand, passing it down the line, and someone else is slapping something on by hand, and then it goes into a heater. I'm thinking, wait a second. Wait, we got 3D printing. How long is this model gonna, gonna hold up? So I wanna know what, uh, how big is or will be the contribution of climate change or new emergency like pandemic to change our countries like especially for US strategy for cross-border car, I mean commerce or trade. Uh, because like in before the COVID-19, uh, US sanctioned or blacklisted uh, top uh, Malaysian uh, like globe manufacturing company it's called Top Globe. So after the COVID-19 pandemic, I mean they lifted the ban, I mean the ban to, yeah. to import the yeah. you know like medical globes from Malaysia. Yeah. So what do you think how big yeah. it is or will be the that's a great question, and I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want to be pessimistic or anything, but I am very, very skeptical about 1.5 centigrade, uh, you know, by 2050. I think we'll blast through that well before 2050. And I, 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 I'm sorry, but I, you know, look at what's happening today with the Ukraine war, right? Energy shortage, supply chain shortages. Um, when there is an existential crisis, you know, we all look after our own needs first, right? And if that means that there's no, you know, you can't turn the lights on next month or you can't turn on the heating next month, um, decarbonization takes a backseat to obtaining energy. And we're seeing that, of course, right? If that means drilling for more fossil fuels, if it means increasing fossil fuel production, well, that's exactly what's happening in the world today. So it shouldn't come as a surprise then that if during COVID, something that was denied for maybe a political reason, if people are hungry or if they're in need, then that, that gets waived. And that's what we've seen with decarbonization. Now, I'm a great believer in decarbonization and I think it's actually, you know, I think there are great economic incentives for decarbonization. But again, if you leave it to the markets, it's not gonna happen. It's just not going to happen, right? Governments have to form the right kind of partnerships. Governments have to pay. They got to step up and they have to fund and they have to penalize and they have to tax and they have to basically do stuff that's going to alter behavior because short term existential issues have to be dealt with. And I do see the world fragmenting around climate change. I mean, look, the North South divide. If the North doesn't pay and spend a lot of money in the South helping them transition to, carbon, you know, to a carbon-free environment, it's not gonna happen. I mean, the next 20 or 30 years of economic growth are all gonna be fueled by coal and fossil fuels. China, India, right? So um, that is where this paradigm shift is, becomes so important because again, the markets aren't gonna drive this. It's, it's going to have to come down to governments pushing it, paying for it, punishing the wrong kind of behavior, and encouraging the right kind of partnerships. Alex, thank okay. you so much. Thanks, guys.